Um, and so um, uh, we'll also make the chat available. So please stay engaged in the chat. Um, had lots of folks reach out after sessions one and two asking if we could get the chat and all the great links that were shared and uh, names of programs that people were referencing at their campuses. So um, please use that chat to engage and also kind of as a log of things that you want to share out with the rest of the attendees. Um, so my name is Jeff Mayo, uh, Assistant Director of the First Year Experience Office here at UT Austin um, with my co-host, Monica Obergon, our graduate assistant in the office. Um, she's going to be leading us through most of the rest of the program. So I'm just going to do a quick welcome and we'll jump into some great content for today. Um, I also want to acknowledge once again um, that this 2022 Transfer Summit comes with uh, the support of the Greater Texas Foundation uh, without their um, funding and um, perhaps even more importantly, some of their guidance as we've put together this conference, we've pivoted to an online model. Um, just really want to thank all the folks there for their support. So again, if you're joining us for our third session, um, this is your third chance to see this. Uh, for those of y'all who are new to the Transfer Summit, just really wanted to highlight what we are all about and what we are trying to accomplish today. Um, first is to spread ideas and initiatives to new campuses. So really just that's the idea of getting best practices out there, sparking creativity for new ideas. Want to amplify student voices. So we're gonna, we have a great group um, of student presenters coming up after our um, panelists here for the second half of our session. Uh, and also the student voices in the chat. We really want to hear about your experiences in there. Um, building proud and informed transfer peer networks. So, you know, let's see some connections. Uh, we also will be sharing out contact information so we can continue the conversation um, uh, after the summit is over. And then to have a professional, or at least we like to think semi-professional, uh, professional development opportunity here. So for our undergraduates in the audience, um, giving you a sense of, you know, we had a call for proposals and we're um, engaging on a professional level and you can kind of get a, a snippet of what it's like at conferences and summits and um, these types of convenings. A couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we've had really good luck with folks keeping their microphones off until they are ready to ask questions or um, they're made the presenters. Um, so please keep that in mind. Uh, take a moment to make sure that your name and pronouns are displayed correctly on Zoom so we can make sure that we are uh, engaging with one, one another um, respectfully. Keeping in mind that together we know a lot, alone we don't know at all. So um, please be uh, share your experiences. That's really the heart of, the, of this experience is to share what we know and what we've been through and what worked, what hasn't worked. And then being open to other folks' experiences that, you know, we all have different paths in higher ed. All of our campuses have different contexts. So uh, just keep an open mind about everyone's experiences uh, as well. Um, just like the first sessions, we are doing a final drawing for a set of Apple AirPods. We will be dropping a new link in the chat. Um, throughout this opening and throughout the um, panelist conversation. Uh, at the end of the panelist conversation is when we will close that out so we can pull the names and have that ready for the drawing at the end. So please make sure to follow that link once you see it available. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation on social media, use hashtag transfer summit, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can also see content from previous summits on there following that hashtag. And if at any point you have any technical difficulties with um, today's session, please email us at fye.ga at austin.utexas.edu. This email is how we've been communicating with you as well. So it should be in your inbox um, if you have any difficulties at all. Um, I also want to highlight our Transfer Summit workbook, which is a project chartering document. 
Um, as I've mentioned previously, this was a really big part of our in-person transfer summit experiences. Over a two-day period, we had five sessions where, that we spent time going over, you know, identifying the challenges on our campuses, um, coming up with possible solutions, um, looking at what other schools are doing to solve those types of issues, and then thinking through goals, benchmarking, um, a risk assessment, communication plans, all the things that you need to know going into making change. Because we really want to, we're all going to leave the Transfer Summit motivated uh, and uh, ready to make change on our campuses. And this workbook hopefully gives you some of those um, tools to make those changes on your campus. Uh, each institution that signs up will receive one or two of these in the mail. Um, and we'll also make the PDF available when we send out um, uh, an email probably early next week that will have the recordings to these sessions. Uh, it'll have a quick survey and then it will have some resources as well. Um, so last, uh, yesterday I highlighted a couple of the earlier pages in the workbook and we certainly don't have time to cover the whole thing. Um, I wish we did, but uh, I wanted to cover some of the later starts of project chartering, uh, which uh, you'll find this in the workbook. It talks about the ideas of constraints and dependencies. So um, one of the pieces, I need to move my camera real quick, um, that I wanted to highlight here is the idea of risks and opportunities. So one thing that um, is recommended in project management is that, you know, we oftentimes talk about what's the risk of taking an action, of making a change, but we don't think of what are the risks of not taking change, right? So we all know that you know, um, for instance, on our campus, um, uh, after one of the transfer summits, we had learned about transfer housing at Baylor University, and we realized that that was something that we're missing out here. So the risk of taking action is, you know, what if we can't fill the spots and, you know, it complicates the contracts piece for housing, but the risk of not taking action is, uh, transfer students will never have that same opportunity that first time in college students have to live on campus. Um, they miss out on creating those uh, communities. And it signals to transfer students that um, they're not a priority to the institution. And so we, by, by looking at both the risks of action and inaction, we were able to make a better case to um, the ultimate decision makers that this is something that our campus needed. Another piece that's important is to think about sustainability. So especially for our student leaders who are here uh, in the audience, you know, your time on campus is limited. And especially as a transfer student leader, you may only be on campus for two or three years. Um, so how do you make sure that the change that you want to make is going to be sustained once you graduate and you're off doing um, really great things? Uh, you need to make sure that there are structures in place, that you have allies, maybe an office that can help move the work forward where it lives with another type of a student organization or a legislative body, a student body on your campus. And then on the back of our uh, workbook on the last page, we have some transfer resources. Um, I wanted to highlight this in our session today, just because these have been really great partners. Many of them have been really great partners for our office and for this transfer summit event. Um, um, I especially want to point out um, NISTS, the National Institute for the Study of Transfer Students. Uh, Transfer Nation, Heather Adams was one of our panelists in our first session. She runs that Facebook group and all forms of its social media. The National Resource Center for the First Year Experience in Students and Transition. Um, they're doing more and more work in the transfer realm as well. Um, and so the NRC uh, is another great resource that um, works, especially with transfer students in that um, first year on campus. And then um, lastly, Tau Sigma National Honor Society. Um, uh, last year, they were super active in the chat. Um, I wonder if folks want to, um, can you give yourself a little shout out in the chat if you are part of Tau Sigma? Um, we'd love to see y'all uh, in the, active in the chat. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point out some of those really great resources that if you're not familiar with, um, uh, they are super helpful for students, faculty, staff who are interested in transfer. 
All right, so that brings us to our topic for today. So today's theme is transfer student mental health. Uh, it really should go without saying <laughs> why this is an important topic, um, but just to make the case. Um, and a lot, a lot of this information comes from a report that was written by the American Council on Education um, uh, that I found also through the Jed Foundation. Um, we have Nicole here as one of our panelists. Um, but there was a 2017 chron um, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education survey of university presidents and um, uh, vice presidents of student affairs. And they identified as the number one top concern um, with student mental health. This is above funding. This is above uh, accreditation issues. It is student mental health. Um, approximately one in three students on campuses, they meet the requirement uh, meet the criteria for a clinically significant mental health problem, including depression, anxiety, eating disorder, or self-injury. Uh, research documents the impact of untreated mental health issues uh, holistically on the student. You know, mental health does not live in a bubble. Uh, it affects academics with uh, a negative correlation to GPA, uh, enrollment discontinuity, and dropping out. And then there's been recent research that actually shows that transfer students may be more likely than their peers to uh, experience stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, uh, and so um, other groups that were included and likely to have stress, anxiety, and depression are upperclassmen, which oftentimes is transfer, and students who live off campus, again, often transfer. So there's all these different um, uh, demographic pieces and intersectionalities to transfer that can compound mental health concerns. Um, so really glad we have our panelists here today and our students who are doing great work to help embed mental health support into their programming. Uh, so I, right now I'm going to kick it over to Monica to um, uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, thank you, Jeff. and. Uh... I would like to introduce our two panelists for today. Um, we have Nicole Mullis, who is a campus advisor for the Jed Foundation. Um, in her role, uh, she works with colleges and universities across the country through the Jed Campus Program, which is a four-year program that guides the, uh, schools through a collaborative process of comprehensive systems, um, programs, and policy development with customized support to build upon existing student mental health, substance misuse, and suicide prevention efforts. Uh, prior to this position, she worked as a mental health counselor at the University of Mont Montevallo, um, and she is a licensed professional counselor in Alabama and a national certified counselor. Uh, she received a BA in psychology from Auburn University and completed her master's of education in counseling with a concentration in clinical mental health at the University of Montevallo. Um, and then for our second panelist for today, we have Kim Morton. Uh, she's the director of transfer recruitment and retention at Appalachian State University. Um, in the office of admission, transfer admissions and engagement, uh, she provides leadership to the university's transfer student recruitment and pre-transfer advising, um, the transfer and engagement of transfer students to Appala uh, Appalachian's campus and strategies to ensure transfer students persist and graduate. Dr. Morton has worked with transfer students for the past 18 years at both the community college and university level to ensure access, immersion, and success. She graduated with her bachelor's from Gettysburg College, her master's degree in student affairs in higher education from uh, Kutz, Kutztown University, and her doctorate in education in uh, educational studies from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, her dissertation research focused on the ease of students' use of Virginia's guaranteed admissions agreements. So, welcome our two panelists for today. Um, for a start off question is just kind of like a icebreaker for the two of you either or could answer first um, but our first question is what is your connection with transfer oh. 
Oh, Kim, I, I guess I'll go first. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure we'll do that a lot today. So wonderful, and thank you for having me. My connection to transferring started when I transferred myself. In undergrad, I started at Florida State University and transferred to Auburn University and navigating just higher ed as a, a first gen Puerto Rican student and as a person, just really knowing that that process, I feel like now there's a lot more support than there was when I went through that process. So that really informed a lot of my own desire to work with college students because then as a counselor in my previous role was able to really counsel people either on that transition out of our school and just trying to help them navigate that um, decision or kind of um, on the other end as students are transferring into our institution and then now in my role with Jed I always try to have a, a plug to to making sure that transfer students are always being included um, in all of the programming and efforts that are being made on college campuses so I will turn it over to Kim. Thank you and it's great to be here as well I will um, put one little plug in it's Appalachian State when you're in this region even though I grew up in Jersey and I said Appalachian growing up when you come down here it's Appalachian so just make that one little clarification. Um, I got in, um, into working with transfer students through um, by working at a community college so I worked at a school in Virginia um, for about 10 years um, and I would help them transfer, but then I also see them come back because they felt comfortable with the staff and the folks they had been with at the community college. And so they weren't reaching out to the resources on the four-year institution because it was usually much larger. It was usually a little more overwhelming. And so they kept coming back to, to, to me and to us to ask those questions. Well, how do I do this? And how do I do that? And you're trying to encourage them to get um, integrated into their new campus. Um, and so then as I um, looked to make a change, I, I ended up on the other side of it, working in a four-year institution, helping with the transfer process. And, and at App State, we have we have a quite a large office of, um, we're gonna, we're expanding to 22 people in our office that work with transfer students. So um, we really do help the students from the very beginning when they're first starting to think about it all the way through to graduation. It's actually, um, we have a uh, transfer alumni network we're trying to get off the ground. So we want to stay involved with alumni after they graduate. That's really great to hear. Um, Nicole, you brought up a good point about inclusion and um, making sure that the, the transfer students actually feel included as well as uh, Kim brought up with uh, Appalachian uh, and your office having such a large group uh, to be able to help the students and to provide those connections for them to transition and to provide that retention for them as well. So that's awesome. Um, second question for both of y'all. Uh, I'll start off with Nicole since, since you went first. Um, as we have seen over the course of about two years, there has been an addition of a global pandemic um, that has altered plans in higher education for transfer students. Um, and I'm pretty sure in both of your roles, you've been able to see that. Um, and what are some of the challenges that transfer students are currently facing or that you have seen? Sure. So, you know, I think they're similar to just what we're seeing in students in general, but more specifically, obviously, with transfer students with the concerns with regarding just like basic needs and housing insecurity, financial insecurity. So that's something that we're seeing a lot, but I think when you're able to stratify the data of who's experienced in that way, a lot of times it's transfer students. So I, I, um, that's the first thing that I really wanna know and I feel like it's really important. And two, just, I think the isolation and social anxiety and just a lot of what we're all experiencing, right? Like we're all, like I'm in my house right now, we're all in a remote world, but, navigating transferring to a new school where now you're having to not be able to connect in the same way that you were able to do in person. I um, mean, it's a little bit harder to find the resources again when we're kind of more in an isolated world. And then, so that's kind of what we're seeing and I have statistics, you know, to prove that, but then more on like, as an anecdote, I just knew a lot of students were transferring in, in general of, of just kind of realizing because of these financial concerns, do I need to move back home? Or it, I think the pandemic just really, I don't know, uh, I guess that just really, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to maybe some decisions that they were making as students. So anyways, I don't really have statistics to back that up, but I just know we're seeing a lot more, um, a rate of students th that are transferring. And I think that, um, again, not really knowing that school or even the disappointment of like, oh, I thought this was gonna be more 
of a happy experience. And now I'm still really lonely and, and, and I still really, you know, I don't feel as connected. So um, anyways, I'll leave it to Kim, but, but from my experience, those are things I'm seeing. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the, um, how it impacts transfers more is as we are hopefully coming out of this COVID, um, the, the, uh, the first year students, the students who came as their first year are going to have four years, three and a half, four and a half years. So while their first year might have been disrupted in their second year, it's just a slowly build up to more of the normal. Um, transfer students, sometimes they're only at the school for two years. And so they, their total time of, of experience may have been disrupted. Um, and so, and that's a sad part because they're often transferring to a four-year institution for that experience. Um, and so um, I know at App last year, while we might have been open, um, it was a mixed bag of how much we actually did in person, um, how many events, how many events we were, we were still social distancing, and it really impacted them. Um, and then this year, I mean, we finally have gotten to the point where, okay, you don't have to wear masks, we can have something. But like um, Nicole said, then the social anxiety, they haven't made friends sometimes, and they're not as apt to jump join in. Um, we're also seeing a and it's not just on transfer students, this is for all of our students, kind of a, I almost, I want to say hangover, but that's probably not the best word to use, but you know what I mean, in academics, because they were on Zoom, now they're trying to get back in the classroom, they don't even, it, they've lost that ability to have interaction in the classroom, there's still that hybrid model in some instances, um, and so, and we had pass fail for so long that they're struggling and our retention rates are starting to decline, um, a little bit more than we like to see because of some of this hangover, for lack of a better word, um, of what was going on with online learning. But on the flip side, we found that some folks really excel in online learning. And so our app state online, our online programs are um, much more popular than they would have been two years ago, two and a half years ago. So, but definitely getting integrated. There's a lot of um, social anxiety still that's been exasperated by, by this. Can I add something really quick onto that, Kim? Because I think you bring up a good point too. Of, I think a lot of students, at least I saw this because I was still on hired as a counselor from 2020 to 2021. And this idea of the how they see themselves students as a student in the sense of really feeling like a failure and reminding them the system changed, not you. But a lot of students were seeing in, in a lot of the data this I, I kind of um, won't go too much into the weeds but we're really seeing that idea of like the lack of um the uh confidence in, in their academic skills and again not realize that it really isn't a reflection of them it's really a reflection of the system changing so anyways um just yeah. wanted to add that on to kim's point definitely because our faculty were still learning how to teach online um throughout the beginning part of it and so it was a big disruption thank you for both of your responses i I feel like it, it is a pro and it is a con that we went through this. Um, a pro is that you know transfer students are thinking more critically about what they specifically need and what they're putting as a priority when transferring to colleges. But then also that con of there's this huge disruption. And Nicole, I had to write down that that phrase that you told me the system changed, not you, because I feel like I also need that that type of reminder as well, um, even as faculty, as staff members, as students, as transfer students, we all just need that reminder that it's it's the system changing and it's it's not it's not our own um, fault and it's just our adjustment and giving ourselves that grace as well. So thank you both for those responses. Um, now more to a little bit more specific to each of your roles. Uh, Nicole, uh, with you working at the Jed Foundation as a campus advisor, what are some uh, much utilized resources provided to partnering colleges and universities um, that you have seen to address the student mental health? Sure. So the number one, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the survey out of the University of Michigan. It's called the, the Healthy Minds Network. Sorry. Um, and, and they have a student survey. So we always really encourage all of our schools and you don't have to be like a, a JED campus to do it. But I, I really like to start there because it's really a campus climate survey of really the perceptions of student mental health and just how students perceive their own health it, it is in general. And I really like to encourage schools to do that because a lot of times in higher ed, 
specifically. We all love to try to figure out what students need, but we forget to ask them sometimes. So really encouraging students to participate in that survey. I've really been able to see that to be really helpful to my campuses, specifically to transfer students, because when you are able to administer that survey again from the University of Michigan, you're able to stratify it. So I encourage them of like, look at the data, who is not feeling connected to campus, who is not, and typically, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. A lot of times we see those as transfer students or to what uh, Jeff said earlier, students that are off campus or um, the upperclassmen. And again, that overlap with transfer students. And then also, you know, we make a strategic plan with all of our campuses. That's not a shameless plug. I'm explaining kind of how that works for transfer students is we really try to personalize it in, but in alignment with our recommendations. And because of that, we don't really endorse any like specific resource. So it's not like we're able to come in and be like, hey, I'm able to be a counselor for you all. It's just, hey, here are the recommendations. So we have a playbook with all other schools that are a part of JED campus. So specifically, if I'm working with a school, and again, just because of my own background, I'm always like, what about transfer students? We have examples of other schools in our network that are able, that have like some um, programming or flyers or, or just like to really help them. So it's, that's kind of how I see our work being really helpful is it's not just an empty kind of like, hey, we recommend this. It's we also have examples of how to do it. Um, so, so that's something that I really feel like is um, is also really helpful in the work that we do. That's that's great to hear and knowing that it's um, not just recommendations, but also resources that you've seen either be successful on other campuses or other campuses have utilized and that it could be uh, replicated elsewhere in the same setting. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, moving to Kim, uh, Dr. Morton, uh, being at the university level, how has your Office of Transfer Admissions and Engagement adjusted to transfer student needs? I know you've kind of touched on it with retention and how that's been um, an issue with, with campuses. Um, and then in particular, how have your programs addressed the mental health of transfer and non-traditional students as well? Sure. So one thing I want to um, just clarify from the beginning is that we, uh, I'm not a mental health expert. I didn't, don't have a counseling degree like Nicole does. What I do and what we do at App is we collaborate. We're a big collaboration school. And so um, when, when we see needs being unmet or we see um, some gaps in services, that's when we outreach and we bring folks in to, to, to help along it. So um, the other nice thing about App is we there's always a stigma of getting help for mental health counseling, um, but I don't find it as, um, we haven't found it as um, bad at apps. So we actually have to um, implement a lot of group counseling because there's just not enough individual counseling sessions available for our students. So one of the things um, that we've worked with the counseling center to do is a transfer counseling group. Um, and so it allows students that are in the similar, um, going through a similar transition, a similar, um, integration challenges to um, to work with other students going through it together. So we have worked with them on a counseling group and some of their themes, um, I had reached out to them ahead of this. I'm like, okay, what are some of the themes you guys are seeing? And it's basically what we've been talking about, um, struggling to get connected on campus, feeling um, social anxiety, missing friends from back home or meeting people here, similar things that we always hear about transfer students. And 75% of our students do live off campus as well. So it's a lot of that um, when they first come here. Um, our social work department also has put together a care collabor collaborative group and they do group um, counseling as well, their students do. And so they put together one called Balancing Act for our non-traditional students. And so we help and what we're, you know, what I'm doing is I'm helping get that word out and we're um, marketing it and encouraging students to do it. Um, we also have our, we have transfer student mentors, and one of the things that we work with our faculty and staff with, because when I say the word mentor, it's not a true mentor-mentee relationship, since we have 1,500 new students every year, and about 15 mentors, and so obviously that would be way overwhelming, um, but what we like to do is provide the opportunity, so if a faculty, staff, a parent, um, student themselves raises their hand and says, I'm struggling. I'm not getting connected. I've been here for two months and I haven't really met anyone. 
um, we're going to hook them up with a mentor, um, pay for them to take them to lunch or coffee or something like that, and and help them form that relationship, get some friends, um, some advice and some friendship. Um, and then the mentor usually brings them to some of our engagement events that we offer for transfer students. Um, Jeff had mentioned at the beginning, um, a residence hall, and we are lucky enough to have a residence hall for our transfer students. Um, and it's a it's, uh, former hotel. So what is nice about that is it gives us ballrooms and meeting rooms and opportunities to um, do engagement um, over there. And so we have 250 beds for those transfer students. So we're really excited about that. This is our first year having a um, residence hall totally for transfer students. So a lot of that is how we do it. We do a lot of um, social events. We work with other departments to put on a de-stress fest at the end of the semester and bring in therapy dogs and massage therapists and um, do some breakout sessions on how you can um, prepare for finals and the stress of finals and things like that. Um, we have a, a kind of created an ad hoc road group that's looking at our um, non-traditional students. App is a very traditional um, age campus, but we do have about five to eight percent of non-traditional students. Um, and so their support just wasn't there. And so we pulled together some folks that have that as an interest and we're trying to provide additional support and um, with for them. And so it's really for whether you're a student leader on this call or a, um, a professional, it's the collaboration. Um, and I've done different sessions for that at different conferences, but that to me is key because you're never going to be an expert in what, any one thing. And so utilize the folks on campus that are experts to help your population, um, and in this case, transfer students. Thank you, Dr. Morton, for, for bringing that up and um, emphasizing the collaboration between different uh, parts of campus as well. Um, I like that you pointed out that the transfer students will sometimes come to your office first and then you will kind of lead them into a, into a direction to where they need. Um, and also that group counseling for transfer students, um, sometimes transfer students um, would love to hear from students themselves that were transfers or that are transfers to um, kind of have that, that relationship building and that you also provide those mentors for students that, that you have seen as like, a, needing that high need of a mentor just for that one-on-one -on -one connection um, that they just may need that at first before actually jumping into um, campus and into uh, academics and everything else that goes along with uh, transferring to a uh, university. So yeah, thank you for a, that. Yeah, sure. It's so hard for our transfer students to sometimes just take that first step. And that's mm -hmm. Tell them we have a phrase we use is you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You need to be comfortable putting yourself in that uncomfortable situation. And then we use our mentors when we're in events. And I heard a long time ago at a conference calling it the spatula effect, where you're just going around and you're feeling those people that are on the sides, not interacting off and into the conversation and the activities. And so that's what we really um, use our mentors for. That's, that's really great to hear and, and knowing that they're being included. And even if the students are, you know, they, they need someone to reach out to them rather than um, them reaching out to the, to the office as well. Uh, Nicole, uh, on the Jed Foundation website, it stated that over 4.8 million uh, young adults uh, attended schools that use Jed programs to support their mental health. Uh, Jed's Foundation's uh, CEO, John McPhee, um, wrote an op-ed article for the U.S. News titled The Pandemic Can Pave the Way uh, to Better Mental Health Care, where he talked about the rise in mental health challenges in young adults. Um, how has your work supported universities and specifically transfer students in meeting their needs? Yeah, absolutely. And you did say it right, so that is fine. I was on mute, so I was trying to tell you that it was right. But, you know, I think that's a very big question, so I'm going to try to condense it right to be helpful to you all. But the first thing, you know, I know sometimes that article can be misleading of like, well, how, you know, are you saying it was a good thing that we went through this pandemic? And it's not that I think there's just more, you know, I think before, I'm sure a lot of students probably feel this on the call, we really romanticized what being a college student was. And what I mean by that is like, it was normal to pull all nighters, right? Like it was normal to do all the things and be involved and 
not sleep and not eat, you know what I mean? Like all of it was in our media. So I feel like the pandemic really shed light of like how we treat college students and that this was not normal, right? Um, and not healthy is more importantly and not sustainable. So I just wanted to add that too. And I think a lot of schools, similar to Jeff's point earlier, that, that this is now to the level of the presidents that we are really realizing that mental health is really important. So I just kind of wanted to add that first, but, you know, on our work with, all of our campuses, the main thing that we do is we really try to, to set the tone that mental health is one, not just counseling, like not, you know, we all have mental health and I know, hopefully you all have heard that by now, but as a reminder, we all experience it to some degree and specifically college students and reminding each institution that we work with that it's a campus-wide commitment to that work. So really, and, and that's really the place that if you look at our impact report after the four years, we always see a high increase of how schools, because a lot of times um, before we come, it's like, well, all of mental health was kind of in the counseling center, not really across everywhere where it needs to be. So I would say whenever I'm working with a school, because then I, the reason why that's the first goal is because it's usually easier to implement everything else if you have that support from the top originally. So I would say that's kind of how we help students in general, but obviously specifically, you know, students that are transferring. And then because we use a comprehensive public health approach, two of our, I mean, obviously I, to preface, transfer students are gonna fit into all of our approaches, all students, but specifically we have a life skills domain of really educating schools on like preventing like trying to promote positive mental health does not just mean like how you handle stress. It's also like, how do you handle your finances? How do you handle just tough conversations with roommates or with relationships? How do you handle, you know, I was a Hispanic student. I was the first student in my family to go to college. How did I navigate where I didn't really fit in in either world, right? And I think a lot of people, I can go on a whole other tangent about that. So really educating schools on what skills are really helpful for college students to know. And also, again, we encourage them that a lot of times this happens at universities in different departments and a lot of there's not a, um, a lot of collaboration to Kim's point. So I love hearing that there is a lot at App State. Of, so really making sure that a lot of times we offer those at schools, but we don't always communicate it to students. And again, really being mindful of how do you communicate that to transfer students. So really having those conversations of a lot of time that's in a first year experience, but like to Jeff's point, a lot of you all are not gonna you know, have that same experience. So do we need to have a transfer student experience course? Again, all of those are kind of more dependent on the school, but um, I would say within, within that area is an, a really big way that we can help transfer students on our schools. And then also just promoting connection among students is another part of our domain area. You know, can we have like a lounge for transfer students with like a printer or snacks or all, you know, a lot of times you don't feel like you have a place because you're not a freshman, you know, all of those things. So again, all of that was is in, within our approach. So I just kind of um, offering some examples of ways that I have done it. And lastly is really encouraging a peer counseling or peer um, mentoring, sorry, to Kim's point, that's another thing that we really encourage schools to look at for all different types of identities. But um, anyways, I will leave it there because that can be a long question, so. I like the point you brought up about the transfer student spaces, particularly because um, first year students have been able to come into a campus and kind of establish their own little space that they would like to stay at whether it be the library, whether it be their uh, building where they have their most of their classes at and transfer students when they come into the program, they haven't really established that. And especially if they've been online for a year, maybe a year and a half, they really are, they have that feeling of being lost or just the sense of belonging and having that specific transfer space is very vital for them to, um, to feel like they have a place on campus as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and then a question for both of y'all, and I want to uh, have uh, Dr. Morton speak first. Um, according to recent research, uh, something we've been touching on today, uh, transfer students are more likely to have a lower financial aid um, when coming into uh, their new university or new campus, more student debt, um, and then at a higher risk of mental health diagnosis. 
Um, how do you see these issues contributing to the overall well-being of students? And I think something that adds to that is they have this feeling that they're behind um, because when they're comparing themselves to the, the folks that graduated from high school who went straight to a four-year institution, all of a sudden they're starting to feel behind and they have this feeling that they need to catch up and they still need to graduate at the same rate that someone who might have gone um, straight to a four-year school and not that they're going slower, but sometimes not all of our credits transfer and sometimes um, it's a wavy line. And one of the things, you know, um, Nicole mentioned the romanticism of higher ed with um, being up all night and cramming for a test. I think so, something that also some a stigma we also have is that you have to be done in four years. And that's awesome if you can do it in four years, but we need to take the pressure off that it doesn't have to be done in four years. If you have to work in order to um, afford your education, then there's nothing wrong with taking five or six years. Um, I always tell the students that I work with, you know, unfortunately, you're going to be working until you're 65 or 70. There is no race to get out into that workforce. Sometimes adulting is not as much fun as you think it's going to be. So enjoy your time in at college. And if it means you're doing 12 credits um, at a time and you're also working and you're taking yourself care of yourself, men, um, you know, mentally, then do it. Do what's right for you. Don't ever compare yourself to other people. And I think that's really something um, we try and impress on our students. And it sometimes goes against what the rest of the university is impressing. They're with their advisor and like, okay, you got to be doing this and this and this. And we just need to restart that conversation. So that's that's my big part of that answer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, a great point, Kim. I appreciate that too, because it um, I kind of echo what I was going to say, so I will add something else. Um, no, but I, I also feel like, you know, I'm going to be pulling more from me being a counselor and kind of being able to counsel college or transfer students in my experience. So not statistically, it's again, more anecdotal, you know, when you are trying to juggle so many things, you know, if, if, again, speaking in a general way, if you are a, like having a family, right? Like I noticed like an, another, the panel was being a student parent or non-traditional, all of those things are going to, especially the financial aspect, are, are going to affect your mental health when the majority of your day is spent on like, if I'm, how am I going to pay rent next month? How am I, you know, like, obviously there's not a lot of room for your academics. So what I would see a lot of times was this, well, now I feel like a failure at both. I'm falling behind at work and now I'm falling behind at school because I'm really trying to do both. So I always like to encourage people that the measuring stick that you use is not always going to be the same for everything, right? Like, a, like it's really important to, to give yourself some grace and to Kim's point like it does not happen need to happen in four years and I love that example of like you're right like it's not super super fun to be an adult so why rush it right like enjoy school and and I, you know I think you would help you be a professional too having some experience in the workforce and all of those things which hopefully you know um but yeah you know so typically if you're concerned about um your um words, sorry, if you're concerned about your finances, what I'm trying to say, that also can bleed into just nutrition, right? Food, housing and security, all of those things, which hopefully it's not news to ever, anyone, all of that is going to impact your overall, um, you know, just your health in general and specifically your mental health. So those are the things that I'll add. Thank you both, both of y'all for um, adding in those, those additional points. Uh, Definitely being a twice transfer student in undergrad, and I definitely romanticized the fact that I was going to graduate in four years, um, and I felt burnt out, honestly, after my freshman year of college, and I took an entire year off. I felt like I had to do something during that year. I just had this like overwhelming feeling that I needed to, to still do some type of schooling. I still needed to work and I didn't really give myself that grace that year. And I think that really affected me going into um, having a tougher time transitioning and transferring. Um, and like uh, one of the uh, attendees today pointed out, there was a study that uh, students that graduated in five years were more uh, launched more successfully than those that launched in four. Um, and graduating in five years and now being in grad school, not thinking that I would really ever go to grad school. I thought I was going to become an adult with a full-time job and go into the workforce right away. It was, it was a very different experience and it worked out for me in that way. Um, and not seeing it then um, when I came back home, but seeing it now and being really appreciative 
about taking that break, especially needing that just just a break in general um, and feeling like that's not that's not a, that's not a, a look of failure. That's a look of um, actually prioritizing yourself and prioritizing uh, what you need as an individual. So thank you for your two points that you made. Um, Can I add something really quick, Monica? I'm yeah, so go ahead. Go well, ahead. One, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that's really important for students to hear. Taking a year off is not unproductive. I always compare it to like an oil change. Like you can keep driving your car without an oil change for a while, but what's going to happen? It's going to break down, right? So it's like, it, it literally is, you're preserving yourself by taking care of yourself. And I, I, I'm hopeful that mind shift is, is where we're heading as a country, but that's a whole other thing. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add, something that we try to help schools and hopefully for any of you here listening, we ch- a lot of times transfer students are not gonna fit into the eight to five model that higher ed is in, right? A lot of those resources, like I know I love working eight to five, but a lot of our issues and needs, especially if you're a student parent or if you're working, a lot of times you're not able to access the free resources on campus from timing. So I'd always like to remind schools or just uh, um, to really to be in, um, to be intentional with if we're able to offer maybe some after hours or offering some things on Saturdays. Anyways, it's another thing I like to add. So thanks for letting me add that. Um, and I know we're a little bit short on time. Um, but I wanted to kind of uh, leave us with some parting words um, for our attendees as um, just how student leaders can actually play a role in um, helping address these transfer student uh, mental health resources or any type of um, resources that can be on campus that could be of use for transfer students and addressing these challenges that they have um, been facing um, and how they can uh, provide that sort of um, additional support for students and how student leaders on campus can, can do that in their uh, respective campuses. Sure. I, I think there's two things there. One is them being knowledgeable of what resources are out there already so that when they're working with students through orientation or through events or um, in a um, in a transfer center that was talked about on there, they're able to point the students in the right direction um, so that uh, we are so inundated with um, so much information. It's sometimes hard for students to find the resources they need. Um, and so if someone can give them a, a referral or, hey, I've been there or just walk them over, I think that would be helpful. But the other thing is providing feedback to your institution. So if there is a gap in services, pointing that out to the institution. And you may have to point it out to multiple people because one person you pointed out to might not be someone who can make a change or feels like they can make a change. Um, but providing that feedback that, hey, we really need this or um, wouldn't it be nice if we had this. Um, sometimes us older folks that are going through our day to day, we miss that what it is that is um, missing. Um, and so by pointing out what would be helpful. Now, it's not automatically guaranteed we're going to get it, you know, if it's a spacing space resource or a funding resource, but it provides them the direction of working on providing the, that service to them. And so I encourage the leaders to, to, if you hear things that students are saying would be nice, or if you hear things that aren't working because whatever office closed at five and I can't get there till seven, um, providing that feedback is helpful. I don't have much to add to Kim's point because I think it's really everything that she said to be more mindful of making sure that all of the voices that you have are shared. And I think the fact that we have this many students on this call, I think is a really encouraging start. So I really encourage you all, hopefully this is the momentum that you all needed to continue doing this work at all of your campuses. So if you ever have a student survey, you know, that you're like, oh, I don't really, you know, I'm tired or busy. Like if you're able to take those five minutes and really, you know, because to Kim's point, even when I worked at higher ed, like it is sometimes hard to hear what students are are really needing and this you know it anyways I just really encourage you all to use your voice however you can and know that we are working to to make it a top-down approach so it's not only like you having to speak up we're also trying to help administration also hear your your needs but I'm um, just really encouraged by all the students that are in this and keep up all the great work awesome well thank you both um for 
adding into this this conversation over transfer students and just students' mental health in general in um, campuses and being able to see the approach that it can start with students, but then also providing that um, additional resources and support for the administrators and for the deans at the top to be able to uh, implement those policies or approaches uh, that can really benefit the students um, overall. Um, so thank you both uh, for uh, participating as our panelists today um, and um, looking forward to seeing all the great uh, work y'all are uh, providing for uh, students and transfer students in uh, Appalachian State and then also uh, overall in campuses uh, as, a, as a campus advisor. So thank you. So now, uh, moving from the panelists, now we're going to be seeing a presentation put on by the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and I believe they are on, yes, they are on. Um, and today we have a presentation um, from the STARS Trans Transition Mentorship Program. Um, so we have Michelle Moreno and Viviana Alvarez on uh, for us today and uh, a little bit about each of these students. Uh, Michelle is a uh, STARS transition mentor and she works in supporting transfer and re-entry students as they balance academics and personal life um, with a method of intrusive mentoring uh, and she connects them to resources they need, support in the acclimation to campus, schedule planning and general questions. Uh, Viviana is the program coordinator with services for transfer and reentry students and uh, is also the transition mentorship uh, program coordinator. So please help me in welcoming our two uh, student presenters for today. Hello, thank you Monica for that warm introduction and having us here today. Um, and thank you Nicole and Kim for setting us up so well for our presentation. Um, we're going to start sharing our screen, um, and our presentation will be about um, transition mentorship um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, with our um, STARS, which stands for the Services for Transfer and Reentry Students. Um, Jeffrey or Monica, can we get screen share available so that we can display our presentation, please? I think you should be able to now. Okay. Uh, well, we're getting that settled. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself again. My name is Michelle Moreno, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm a fourth year here at UC Santa Cruz studying Spanish language and linguistics and have been working um, as a transition mentor at STARS for almost a year now. How are you? Awesome. And my name is Viviana Alvarez. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I am a program coordinator with STARS. You hear us refer to the acronym a lot. Um, I had the privilege of joining the STARS community back in August 2019 when the Transition Mentorship Program was just in its beginning stages of being um, created from idea to um, fact. And so it's been really incredible for this to be a very hands-on experience in building it. Yes, we saw your note, Zara. So let us know if you can't hear us um, too clearly. We're also in California where it is a little hot today. So I've got the fan and our AC or uh, filter going. So that might also be um, really distracting too. So just let us know what you need from us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, also important to know is that there are some housekeeping things we want to address. First and foremost, here is the link to the slide deck. We are taking a quality or a quantity over quality approach today, which is very unlike us, but there is so much to breeze through that there are going to be a lot of hyperlinks we invite you to visit and attend to at your own time. With that being said, though, and this happens every time I share hyperlinks as 
I'm very um, open to sharing resources, but please do not send a request for edit access. Just hover over to file and make your own copy in order to um, utilize the resources to your, to your own advantage. Um, so thank you all so much for that. And then uh, within introductions, we also want to offer you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves into this community. In the link, we just dropped an opportunity to do that through Padlet. If you haven't used that platform before, we highly recommend you do. And you can always come back to it through this hyperlink here. Everything underlined and in blue is a hyperlink to Rivisa at another time. Awesome. Thank you, Viviana. Uh, we hope during our time together, we're able to um, learn the following learning objectives. Firstly, in this session, we'll address a few components of creating and maintaining a successful mentorship program. You'll learn about utilizing scripted quarterly check-ins to guide conversations with the mentees. You'll learn how, to mentor, how mentors establish trusting relationships with mentees that welcome them to move through fear and uncertainty. You'll learn how to embody and uplift a work culture that invites everyone to be their authentic selves. Um, in this organized, um, we've organized the overview to cover the foundation of TMP firstly, secondly, um, components of intrusive mentorship, and thirdly, our STARS work culture. Okay, so really jumping in to build the foundation of TMP. So first and foremost, we want to acknowledge that um, we've always had student staff working in our office as STARS, but they have served as general peer advisors, perhaps similarly to some of the roles you hold, you all hold as student leaders, um, or some of you may be managing general student staff who kind of do it all. You attend the tabling events, whether virtually or in person. You are um, supporting students who are walking into a space if you have a physical one. You're answering emails, picking up the phone. Most of the time, peer advisor positions can be as administrative as they are in advising. But what we were hearing back in 2019 for a couple years was that students wanted a stronger connection to peer advisors in a way that we hadn't envisioned prior to the transition mentorship program. So in 2019, the director, along with the person, my predecessor, um, created TMP to make that direct connection between two students so that an incoming student not only meets a mentor right at the beginning, even before they submit their statement of intent to register, they establish that relationship and then they will continue on together as a mentorship pair for however long the student desires. Um, on paper, we say it's the first two quarters um, to my UC and CSU folks or anyone on the quarter system. That is um, an 11, an intensive 11 week session. And it, so it'll uh, follow them through the summer and the fall along with the winter quarters. So over time, we have really refined a lot of our components um, and we have an increased uh, outreach process. So I think back in 2019, we had maybe less than 100 students interested in joining our program. We were still trying to figure ourselves out. And now in this cohort, um, I can give you these numbers live, we have 61 applicants and we just released the interest form on Monday. So these are going out to admitted students Michelle will tell you a little bit more about that when we get to that section, but it just goes to show that over time, the more established we become, um, folks are learning more about us. And then with regard to visibility as well, we have a lot of meet and greets in the summer with campus partners. So whereas other peer advisor or advising offices really focus on the administrative um, bureaucratic processes of a student's experience, we call ourselves, and I think folks know us here at UCSC as the unicorn office, where we're more so interested in how your loved ones are doing, how you slept last night, how your water intake is, how your kids are holding up. And then we'll also ask who on campus you need to be connected with in order to answer the more academic focused questions. Um, and we get more refined over time because we take a very collective approach to our work. We have very frequent um, pulse checks in our team meetings. We have evaluations, not just for our events, but how we're doing in general. And then I also run a focus group with the transition mentors at the end of every cohort. So this is the third cohort we're in now for them to provide insightful feedback on things like the hiring process, their relationships with mentees, all the way through the trainings that they experience that prepare them for the work that they're doing. 
With regard to our structure, um, I hope it goes without saying, we have our transition mentors are continuing transfer students. I hire very early on, so I put the call in winter quarter. These transition or the students who apply have only been at UCSC for the summer if they took classes and then the fall. I don't have an expectation that they have previous mentorship experience. There are a lot of things that we can teach, but what we can't teach is how to have this um, personal passion for community and uplifting and supporting others. So I can say that pretty confidently that across all of our transition mentors, past, present, and the future, those we've already hired for the 22 cohort, um, everyone is committed to showing up for not just themselves and the job, but for their mentees as well. And in an intensive hiring process, along with very robust trainings, like I mentioned, separate us from the rest of um, campus peer mentorship programs, where some might choose to take a mentorship approach in group settings. We very much pride ourselves on those one on one connections. And if I didn't mention this already, I think you might. There are 25 mentees to every mentor, and we have a team of five mentors. At your own time, feel welcome to, re, uh, to visit the job description, get a sense of what it is a transition mentor is signing up to do upon applying. Our interview questions really set the tone. We are not just here to um, provide a service. We're really here to grow and to develop as um, student staff. Um, well, as the program coordinator, I'm here to develop the student staff in their professional trajectories and then you can also get a sense for what we um, share with the general public with our TMP overview on the hyperlink in line five. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go into um, intrusive mentorship model. Um, at its foundation, it's about addressing important topics. At its foundation, it's about addressing um, important topics before the student asks about it. For example, before a student asks what's housing like on campus, um, we will make sure to ask what are your housing needs. Uh, we take on a strong community oriented role. We are the support direct, we're the direct link between the mentees and campus resources um, that's going to support their personal and academic goals. Um, I always like to share with my mentees that I serve as a liaison between them and the school. Um, but always it's not it's not always exclusively they always um, are able to do it on their own um, but we are always there to support them um, and through personal experience we know as mentors that navigating the transfer journey into a new institution is oftentimes really uh, difficult and confusing um, and a bit scary so um, the contacting programs and offices isn't easy and we let our mentees know the ins and outs that we personally have been able to uh, speak to, um, for example, the financial aid office, I know that it's better to catch them in a drop in or call them directly rather than to send an email. And those are little things that we let our mentees know so that they can have an easier and hopefully smoother journey than we did. Okay. Um, the first step in this whole process is having the admitted students fill out the interest form, um, what Viviana was talking about earlier. Um, it's an extensive questionnaire for admitted students to share a bit about who they are and what they're looking for and wanting from this mentorship program. Um, then our lead transition mentor pairs at least 25 students with a transition mentor based on, the, on who the LTM feels would um, support the mentee best. Uh, for example, based on the interest form, you can find out their salient identities, uh, major, um, how many times they've transferred, um, if they're a parenting student, et cetera. Um, and that will allow the LTM to be able to make that connection. Um, and the way the LTM knows that um, who we are and how we can support them is by holding um, weekly or so often meetings with us um, personally. So the LTM serves as a mentor for us mentors as well. So it's kind of like a chain of mentors, in other words. <laughs> yes. Um, the second component is um, to build the relationship, is holding an introductory one on one with our mentees. Um, this last year it looked like Zoom, um, through Zoom, or it can be in person depending on the circumstances. Um, the, L the TMs thoroughly read the mentee responses to the interest form, um, and we ask the follow up questions of you indicated what you hope to get out of your relationship, how does that align with your expectations you have as me, for me as a mentor? 
um, as well as what are some goals and areas of growth that you would like to work on together? So all of which happens on our first meeting. Okay. And this is a guided conversation through a process which we call the check-in script, um, which I'm going to talk about a bit more right now. Um, and um, during the staff meeting, we review the protocol intentionally, and we encourage our TMs to make a copy of the master agenda, which is what you're seeing right now, I believe. Um, yeah, so you'll be able, will we make a copy of this just so we could simplify it and put in our authentic self and make it more comfortable um, based on our own language, since this is really specific, robust, um, but it just makes sure that we have the recommendations of what we should be talking about so that each mentee is getting the same information across the board. Um, it also encompasses an email version at the bottom formatted as recommendations rather than questions so that the TMs can send it to their mentees after the meeting. Um, as a reminder of what was discussed and um, to those who don't schedule one-on-ones, um, most students sometimes um, we make it really accessible and going along with the um, not one size fits all, sometimes they can't have a meeting with you, they're super busy, so they'll opt for an email. And the email version is what we would send to them so they can still get the same information, still serve as a mentee, but just um, alternatively. Um, yeah, and if I can also add, um, I hope that y'all can see the overview very briefly right now. There. Um, in a quick note, as I mentioned, the priority is really the one on one conversation and relationship between the mentor and the mentee. And they also hold a quarterly event. Um, so in that quarterly event, each transition mentor is facilitating one workshop that will cover a specific matter with regard to transferring into a research intensive quarter system school. So as you can see here, Michelle um, in the fall did cover a the topic of time management. And so when the transition mentors meet with the mentees, they can ask, did you get to attend Michelle's session? And if so, what did you get out of that? And let's have a follow-up conversation about that. Additionally, we had Diego facilitate a workshop on um, transitioning into the quarter system. And so if folks don't know what a quarter system is, I certainly didn't um, coming from a semester system. It is an extremely intensive 11 weeks. And many of our transfer students talk about the um, challenges and barriers they experience with time management, particularly in that transition. So um, it is such a pivotal component to our program. And as scripted as it looks, as Michelle mentioned, the transition mentors, if they don't have mentorship experience, can use this. Sometimes that first meeting is a little nerve wracking. I hire them. Um, uh, sorry to use the quarter system, but they get hired week three and they are meeting with their mentees week eight. I only have five weeks with them and three two hour trainings for those five weeks for them to really feel secure and confident in their roles. And this is one of the ways that we build that confidence. Definitely, it definitely aids in the first time jitters. And um, like again, like I said earlier, to make sure that everybody is getting the same information. Um, even though every conversation is going to move organically and you will talk about different things together based on the students needs. Um, this just makes sure that everybody is on the same page. Yeah, and also Jeffrey to your comment. Absolutely. Um, I think from the get we got really excited and jumped in. Um, but from the get go, I think what's also worth noting is that we take a very whole person approach. Um, actually, this serves as a really great transition as we get into the stars culture at large. So oh, I said I was going to fact check the number. So TMP <laughs> is only one program within stars. And then we've got, I believe, six other programs. As a center, we have a culture um, grounded in community care that really disrupts and challenges and pushes back against a lot of traditional notions and socialized notions of what professionalism looks like or doesn't look like. Um, I think when I first got into this role, yes, I understand that I had vacation time and sick time, but to really genuinely come into a space and talk to my director about, um, hey, I, my headspace is just not where uh, I'm not in a headspace where I can serve and be of use to other people. I need to tend to myself. And over time, there really becomes this trust in sharing vulnerab 
vulnerably where folks are at as people first outside of the work that we give, knowing that we can't pour from an empty cup. So if you come onto the slide deck, you'll be able to uh, access this hyperlink. Um, outside of my TMP job, I really love to facilitate a training on the community care model. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. And um, I learned at the University of Vermont in the higher education and student affairs program. Um, and so learning that there and then coming into stars where it was already integrated we just didn't necessarily have a theoretical framework for it was incredible and so the community care model really marries this idea of what self-love looks like and then what collective um, liberation looks like and so it's not just you escaping a toxic work culture to tend to your personal need we are all collectively invested in supporting one another and getting where it is that we need to go uh, so here's another resource brought to you by our director. It's really important that we also acknowledge how from the top approach, if we didn't have such a supportive director in our um, really setting the tone for what kind of space we are, I think it would make the, the work just a little bit harder. So this is a resource that showcases how there are 15 work practices that are ingrained in white supremacy culture and really what the antidotes are to them. So what are toxic work habits that we bring either into a workspace because we learn them as students or that's how it was at our last institution or in the last workspace and then when we get to this place there is a lot of unlearning that has to happen some toxic work culture or habits are perfectionism either or thinking that is very set in this binary mutually exclusive framework a sense of urgency especially important to challenge in a pandemic when people are literally just trying to get by um, mentors working with their mentees to help them advocate for themselves with their instructors when a deadline is coming up sometimes that's the first time the student even is uh, encouraged and supported in the process of self-advocacy and that is a very important topic to the relationship building component in power hoarding tmp would not be what it is if i made all the executive decisions as a program coordinator as i mentioned the focus groups are very pivotal to our growth and our progress along with weekly one-on-one -on -one staff meetings our retreats with the rest of the team as well so we invite you to check out this resource and ask yourself how in your spaces do you have toxic work cultures and habits that don't allow you or the folks around you to come in as their full human selves and also to the student leaders who are graduating, I don't know if you mentioned that, but Michelle is due to graduate soon. I think we're always talking about here, how do you, we were just having this conversation, <laughs> how do you, um, in the interview process, in reviewing potential job employers, ask yourself, will I be able to be who I, who I am and my fullest and authentically without feeling like I'm walking on eggshells? How does the work culture at this institution or organization um, support my wellness and my overall being. Thank you. Thank you for all of that, Viviana. Um, going along with uh, the work culture and just us as stars as a whole, um, part of our culture is to encourage our mentees to move through the fear and uncertainty, trusting us to guide them through so they don't experience things in isolation. Um, like some of us have experienced before. Um, I know along with that toxic work culture or like capitalist mentality is that we have to do everything on our own and it has to be done quickly. Uh, we are very much um, not in support of that and so that is what our whole program leans towards. Um, by that we mean learning about their goals, encouraging them to pursue them, and are advocating for themselves through different programs. As TMs, we witness and embody the vulnerability in naming our own experiences and challenging them creates a stronger connection and increases the chances our mentees of taking the risk that they want and trying new things because they can learn from our own knowledge. Um, definitely in supporting them with a lot of the heavy load and a lot of the pressure, they can then um, feel more inclined to do things that they actually wanna do and explore. Thank you. Um, 
We are helping mentees be their authentic self as they navigate university life, which may look like getting involved in a community or advocating for their needs and boundaries with their instructors, peers, or loved ones. And this is all part of learning as a growth process and it not being linear. Um, I want to emphasize that we don't just know this coming into the role, um, into the mentorship role. Many of us are very new to this type of work. Um, like before, I used to be a tutor, and we, this was very, very different than what I used to do. Um, and our culture cel here celebrates and honors the unknown and encouraging the learning curve that comes with it. Like I said, um, learning and moving away from that, I have to know everything in this role. Um, much of our approach is informed by the intense, intensive trainings that we get, addressing topics like active listening and community care models. Uh, we also have a series of campus partner meet and greets, like Viviana was speaking about earlier in the summer um, and before our before we meet our mentees. This is the training that we get. Um, we also have this. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, we're not. This is to make sure that we're not just sending off our students off into the entirety of the financial aid office, but rather someone specific that we know and we trust that will make sure to take care of them because they know who we are and what we do. Um, and that helps develop rapport with them um, on a more personal level. As we get to the end of this presentation, we hope you all were able to learn about the pragmatic mentorship requires um, collective buy-in and guidance and intentionality. Um, I hope you were able to take the time to, or learn how to take the time to um, develop the skill sets and confidence of the mentors for the of the mentor for the mentor's professional growth and to increase the mentee's positive experience in the program, which is um, the main point of all of STARS and specifically TMP is to center the um, student. Um, this creates and maintains a culture of community care and challenging all those toxic habits. Alrighty, we're at the end. Thank you all so, so much for spending this time with us. I know it was a lot and we moved pretty quickly you, please feel free to check out our website to learn a bit more about us, our program, and our other mentors that are not here with us today. Um, as a reminder, um, we'll pop the link to the slide deck in the chat so you all are able to click on those hyperlinks underlined in blue um, if you'd like to go back and get more of your process. Um, and to find out more about us, and please feel encouraged to introduce yourself on the Padlet that we shared earlier as well and is put in the chat. Does anybody have any immediate questions that we can answer? Um, any comments, concerns? Feel free to uh, put them in the chat or, or um, come up uh, your mic. While y'all are formulating your questions, I also want to give a shout out to a very special guest in the audience, Diego, who is another transition mentor with us. If you want to throw up, you know what I'm about to say, your favorite is emoji um, to let us know who you are and identify yourself. Diego just graduated in the winter and is one of our other transition mentors. So it doesn't look like I see any uh, questions for our presenters, but major kudos to our presenters today um, for their awesome presentation and then also additional resources um, for these student leaders that are also in attendance uh, for this summit. Um, so thank you so much for presenting and uh, for this pre presentation of not just uh, aiding in the transition for transfer students into university, but then also setting them up for uh, seeing what work practices are out there and um, helping assist them into greater success post-graduation um, and trying to uh, navigate their, their careers uh, post-graduation as well. So I thank you both for uh, presenting today. Um, I want to Throw it back over to uh, Jeff, who will be closing us out for today. I just want to thank um, our pre our presenters, um, 
lots of great information. I, I love how, um, and I think this is important for all of us that mental health is not your primary task. That's not what you've been told to do, but it's a part of every little thing it's embedded. And the fact that like you're known as the unicorn office on campus because you put you know students' well-being first and you have that community care model, I think speaks volumes to like the impact that your work has. So I think that's that's so great. Um, but yeah, as uh, Monica said, um, not only are we closing out this session, we're closing out our transfer summit, um, uh, but some of our takeaways um, from today about mental health um, really having an impact on all of our areas, you know, and it's affected by all areas. So it's interrelated with finances, with academics, with personal lives, with family lives, with personal development. Um, there's, so, there's so much there, um, which makes the work even that much more important. Uh, well-being can inform and be embedded into current support programs. Um, sometimes the way I like uh, construct this in my mind is the idea of like, uh, it's great to have like an hour long session about mental health and um, you, you've shared resources, but I think even more impactful are these one or two minute interactions or um, you know, the types of things that you mention on a daily or weekly or monthly basis or points of contact with your students. Um, uh, and you start to have a culture like they do um, at the Unicorn Center. <laughs> so um, we don't have to be experts. I think sometimes we're hesitant to talk about mental health um, because it can feel like a taboo subject or something that's been stigmatized, but we're not going to be able to break that stigma if we're not, if we don't make it comfortable to have these conversations and make safe spaces to share. So, um, but again, thank you to our, our panelists, our presenters, um, uh, and uh, you'll be hearing from us closing out um, the, the summit. Um, most likely early next week. We'll have recordings of all three sessions. It'll go to anyone who registered at all for um, uh, the summit. We'll have a link to a feedback survey. We'd, we would love to get some feedback from y'all uh, about your experience with summit. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have other ways to connect. We'll also have the PD, a link to a PDF of the workbook. So even if you weren't your campus representative who received the physical copy, we wanna make sure that everyone has that as a resource as they plan changes and improvements to transfer support on their campuses. And finally, our third and final AirPod drawing. Um, let me stop sharing so Monica can do her thing. Already spinning. Yes, it's it's been spinning on the side for... Hmm for a while, but let me go ahead and spin it and it'll make a little sound as well as we choose our winner. Everybody's name should be on here that fill out the form. And our last AirPods winner is Becca Ross. Congrats, Becca. Um, we'll make sure to follow up and make sure that we have your preferred mailing address. Um, even if it's different from the one on your registration, we'll make sure it gets to you timely. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I also want to highlight Monica and all the work that she's put into um, coordinating the summit and hosting today, moderating the panel, working with student presenters from all three sessions. Um, uh, we honestly would not have a 2022 summit without Monica. So big thanks to her and all of her efforts and expertise. Um, and so, yeah, like I mentioned, please keep an eye out for our email. We have some great links, um, share these recordings. Why they're not going to be, there's no login It's gonna be made available through the transfer summit website. So if you have colleagues who weren't able to, if you have student staff, you wanna use this during your trainings over the summer or into the fall. Um, I know that folks have used that before um uh as a way to introduce your student staff and mentors and things like that to these really important topics but um i'll say my last thanks for everyone who attended today and our other sessions where you're watching these recordings we really hope that we've made this um, um a valuable resource we've been good stewards of your time uh and and that um we've helped make some connections or made you uh, think creatively about how you 
um, how you think about uh, transfer student leadership more broadly. So uh, thank you all and uh, best of luck going into the end of the spring semester.